Welcome to the Look Good, Move Well podcast. Rocking and rolling. So, Sati, you just sent me a TikTok. Mm-hmm. Hilarious. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna be. I'm sad to say that I'm. I'm very late to the TikTok party, but yeah. I'm getting into it. Yeah. And this video you sent me is hilarious. Some guy with a duck. <laughs> who? If you're, if you're guess, on TikTok, you know this. Video. You know this person. <laughs> this guy charges into his sister's room, like throws a bag of cash at her and like assaults her with a bag of cash, which he's gifting to her for, to pay off her student loans, mm-hmm. which is very sweet and also hilarious at the same time because he threw it he's at He's shirtless her. with a duck. He's shirtless with a duck. His mom is flipping out because <laughs> he bang, he kicks down the door. Anyhow, he made all this money off of his OnlyFans page. Yeah. And so right before we hit record, I'm like, so what is OnlyFans? <laughs> I mean, I, I've heard it referenced hundreds of times. I get that there's, it's, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going to pay money, get through this paywall to see some private content from you and that this private content, I'm assuming is sexual in some way. Oh, it's yeah. like, it's mostly people going, there's not a lot of stuff happening on OnlyFans that isn't nakedness. Or is there? I don't know. I think that there there are some specialty niche OnlyFans that are just pictures of feet or other things that people enjoy paying for without necessarily being explicitly sexual. I see. People can make... So this is the thing about OnlyFans. I think it's really democratized the exchange of money for content. So yeah. you, can, you can make your OnlyFans whatever you want. I see. Yeah. And so it's kind of like... We're putting, um, hmm, how is this, how, what is this like? You're, instead of having the uh, pornography studio mm-hmm. <laughs> concept, mm-hmm. like this company runs all the pornography. Yeah. We've now privatized per- pornography or like it, we've taken, given the hand, given it over to the hands of like the individual to create their own. It's like, you're the Uber driver versus working for the taxi company now. Yeah, or like you know, a industry. lot of a lot of fitness professionals out there want to make their own online fitness program, and you know, I had to do all this stuff for you to get you up and running so that you could sell your fitness program online, and we yeah. could register people and get them take their money and do the Stripe thing, and da 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 da. da. Yes. So instead, it it would be like if you could just you know click a button and get your own thing set up, and there you go. Yeah, but. But are fitness instructors using OnlyFans? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but not for fitness. Well, for whatever they want. <laughs> okay, but that's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to really understand here. Okay. What percentage of it is porno- pornographic? The majority. The majority. Because there's other like... Okay, yeah, that's okay. That's so it's Patreon, OnlyFans. It's like, why did you have to make this, you know, competitor and what's how are they going to stand stand apart? Patreon is for more educational material, right? At least the coffee people I follow have Patreon accounts where you can go learn like more geeky coffee science on their Patreon. You don't expect to see something naughty I'm on their not Patreon. Expecting to see, yeah. But if, <laughs> if, if, if like Lance Hedrick was like, hey, I'm Lance Hedrick. I'm going to teach you about espresso. Click my OnlyFans page. Am I going to show up? I'm thinking I'm going to show up and see him doing, you know, You're going to see his penis. He's going to be pulling shots, you know, in the nude. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's why I've seen people like, oh, check out my OnlyFans page. And they're like, twerking in their you know instagram video and i'm like you like you want to see more like check out my only fans right. page i'm like okay okay this is all sexual yeah. but it's not all i see i think nate takes offense to that a little bit he was like hey it could be it could be legit could be but i mean i think the point is that it's under the creator's control i mean i got it okay Whereas Instagram is not under the creator's control because it's like this public viewing space where if I put out some content that goes against community guidelines, they're going to pull it down. Mm -hmm. Same thing with YouTube, same thing with TikTok, same thing with all these platforms. But if you want to go behind a paywall and and people know what they're showing up to see. That's right. We need an OnlyFans page. (laughs) FBB OnlyFans. Oh my God. (laughs) Just kidding. I mean. Maybe. 
we'd we'd have some people and stuff. I, I got a new <laughs> I got an air conditioning unit that is out of my house. I, we need a new a, air air conditioning <laughs> unit. My kids aren't sleeping. Set it up, Satya. Only twenty-four fans. hours. You could have your new AC. Ah, <laughs> uh, 20, 24 hours. I think you could make an AC unit worth in twenty-four hours. Yeah, Whew, man. I mean, Jeez, but I please. I would put my marketing hat on, of course, and like I have lots of ways that I would promote you. Would promote you. Juice out of this <laughs> yes, as right. Can I get a cut? How can I get three <laughs> gallons out of these two oranges? That's what I'm aiming for. We're gonna. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyhow, and oh yeah, that's hard for me to even <laughs> move forward from that. But we're gonna do it. Okay. And hey, <clears throat> if you went and clicked on the timestamp to go past all this banter, good for you. <laughs> Not necessary. You don't need to hear all that because now we're gonna get into something real, real serious, real, real serious. Mm-hmm. Although, if you are looking to pay for your med school. <laughs> If the question you have is how do you pay for med school versus what do you do if you want to drop What's out of med school? What's the easiest way to pay for med school? <laughs> What's the easiest way to pay for med school? Jeez. Yeah. Med school is expensive. How much was your med school? At the end of one year of medical school, I had $62,000 of debt. Oh. That's like... It's a chunk of change. I mean, it probably was going to... Yeah. By the end of ed- medical education, I was going to be in the 200 plus thousand for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That first year was, was rough because it was, I was an out of state, uh, tuition person, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, that's a big, uh, uh, that I'll, I'll, I'll blame all the UC and California schools that didn't let me in. So thank you for that. Yeah. That's right. I can't believe they passed on this. I know, I right? Mean, come on now. I mean, have they heard you talk about cellular biology on this podcast? <laughs> Gosh, I should. We should send some of that to the, some of the gut microbiome stuff. We should send that right to the admin, uh, the administration, and the uh, um, yeah, the the review team for new candidates to medical school over at UCSF. I'm gonna I'm gonna shuttle it over there. Yeah, they, they will not listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> so why are we talking about med school today? <clears throat> because I recently picked up my mom's phone and the photo album was open on it. And it was scrolled all the way back to like the earliest photos that she had on her phone. And I guess my mom uses, you know, I don't know what she, she's, she does a good job of backing up her phone for photos because she has photos on her phone that go back to 2002, which was way before phones right existed but she has <laughs> done the take all the the actual photographs in her house and then taken them to a digital you know converter and like had them dig- digitalized digitized whatever that is put on a, you know put on her she got it on her apple computer and then she syncs it and all that stuff is there it's way ahead of the game it's it's remarkable how she is in certain ways and then in other areas it's like Wait, how do you, how do I open this app? I'm like it, the you know, let's go. Mom, you're listening to this. I love you. You know so much. You know exactly how much about technology you need to know. All the stuff that you don't know, you don't need to know. I love how you don't have your phone connected to you 100% of the time. It's endearing. Go, Mama Phil. My dad's always trying to get in touch with her and he can't. It's like cuz she's disconnected. Yeah. And that's, that's healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, but yeah, so I started flipping through the fo- the photos and I was like, whoa, like I haven't seen photos like this in, in years. Like, and I just started to like, you know, select all these pictures and airdrop them to my phone. And I had all these pictures from like basically 2002 to 2000 and I don't know. I mean, there's recent stuff, but I didn't like pull recent stuff. I just grabbed things that went until I was more or less like starting my CrossFit journey in 2010, mm-hmm. 2000, yeah, 2010. I think there's some pictures of 2010. So this eight year span, and that goes from when I finished high school, cr- college, taking a couple year break after college, go to medical school, drop out of medical school, start my CrossFit journey, become a coach, become an athlete, 
do the CrossFit Games. So it's like in a, in an eight year period, I went from this kid who was like, I just graduated high school. I'm like going forward. I'm going to have this, you know, I got this amazing life ahead of me. And on that journey, there were some super highs, some super, super, super lows, um, and you know, ups and downs. And then boom, I came out with what felt like the other side. And I felt like that eight year journey really shaped a lot of who I am. And it was very much like, you know, this big stamp on who I, I was as a person culminated in 2009, you know, around the uh, August, September time frame in central Ohio, Columbus, me crying my eyes out on this floor in my, my apartment or my condo, uh, on the phone with my parents saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to the Dean tomorrow. I'm, I'm dropping out of medical school. Yeah. And I, uh, I'm, I'm scared. Yep. Basically. And so that was, uh, that picture, there was a picture that popped up, you know, she helped, she came, she flew out to Columbus and helped me basically get my, my new condo set up with furniture and helped me move in and got me ready to like hopefully have a better second year than my first year. Cause my first year was really torturous for me. Um, so she left, flew home. My dad had paid a visit. He left, flew home about two to three weeks after my second year of medical school started. That's where I found myself. And there was a picture on her phone of the whole house, like all these pictures of the different rooms. And it just happened to be a picture that she took of my bed with the carpet, like the, like the area rug that was underneath it. And I just remembered, I was like, Oh my God, like that was the, I was like in the fetal position right there mm-hmm. on that floor, you know, losing my mind. Yeah. And, uh, so I posted a couple pictures on uh story that were like, it was like a sequence of like, Hey, here's me <laughs> in my white lab coat, you know, at OSU, like smiles, all smiles because I'm like, going to be a doctor and then here's the follow-up picture like months later where I'm like you know here's the bed that I was like at the foot of the bed like lying on the floor crying because I was terrified that I was didn't know what I was going to do where I was headed in life I was I was really fearful and I'm dropping out of school and then here's the next picture uh less than a less than 12 months later me in a uniform a TJ's gym uniform uh, in um, Carson, California at the Home Depot Center um, in the uh, warm-up area for event number one of the 2010 CrossFit Games. And my dad is standing there right with me, like probably the proudest moment of his you know, parenting life, like about to go see my son, uh, compete in this crazy thing called the CrossFit games. But like, there's a lot of people here and people apparently care. Um, and it was like, holy shit. Like this is what can happen in the span of like literally 12 months of your life. Um, you can go from the most optimistic thinking things are going to be all right to like the lowest place that you could ever imagine and thinking that maybe you'll uh like this is so painful that like who wants to live with this much pain and then be like as happy as and and feel as aligned with your purpose as you could ever feel in your life and then of course walk out onto the competition floor and (laughs) endure the most physical pain you've ever (laughs) felt in your life, which was true at the time. That workout was like, it was epic. Um, but yeah, it's just, it was just like three photographs that were taken within, in, in a 12 month period that just, you know, spanned such a wide range of human emotion and, um, the historical context that went with all of it. You know, it was just, you know, it was was like a decade of my life. And um, 
when I wrote that stuff and I, and I put those captions with those pictures, um, I think the people who read it, a, a lot of people who read it just felt immediately had their own connection to some experience in their life that felt similar or that they were going through now or, um, it just, I think a lot of people resonated with, with it, not because they've been to medical school and they dropped out or whatever, but that they've, 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 people go through these big, big, uh, waves of human emotion and experience that are high and low. And I think we're, we're fed this like narrative that you're always supposed to be in in the good in the happy right um and if you're in the good and the happy then you know i think it's the better narrative is like feel grateful for it and know that it's it's not forever it's it's fleeting you'll be you'll be down but if you have these snapshots in your life where you've overcome the things that feel like they're you can never overcome and you might never recover from them because they're so low then it serves as like a just a, a really powerful tool to get through the moderate lows or you know the the daily ups and downs that that happen and um yeah i just i don't i guess i hadn't really revisited that so emotionally um maybe ever because i've told the story so many times of dropping out of medical school but it's in these podcasts in these contexts of like, Hey, how is functional bodybuilding made? It's like, well, I did this, I did that. I dropped out of medical school. I got into CrossFit and it's like, but now I'm like, well, I'm looking at and investigating how do certain, how to, how have these big pivotal events in my life actually shaped who I am? Like, it's not the choice of being in medicine versus being here. It's the experience of going through the scariest time of my life. What at the time was the scariest time of my life to, needing to lean on a few key individuals who chose to show up for me. And when they chose to show up for me in the way that they did, it gave me a new lease on life. And it gave me an opportunity to do something that I am me and many other people are very grateful for now. And I think in, in, in evaluating that experience more deeply, not just the outcomes and the content of what happened, but the, the feelings and the, the fear and the, who was there to support me. Um, it's that more close and deep evaluation of these, these very pivotal times in our life that I think gives me a much deeper appreciation for what kind of impact I can have on other people mm -hmm. and uh, what what I'm actually looking for in the way of support and love and care from other people um, because I I could have gone a hundred different ways and there could have been 80 really good outcomes and 20 mediocre outcomes and five bad ones or whatever but you know I'm, I'm happy that I'm where I'm at today but getting through that and making having even choice to say I'm leaving medical school, but I'm going to open up other choices for myself did not just happen by myself. And it wasn't just because I was brave and I was the one that like had this, you know, I did the, I did the thing that was hard. Like, yeah, I took some hard steps, but I didn't do it alone. I had some really great people around me and, uh, anyhow, I was, that's why we're talking about this, Satya. Okay. Back to your original question. Yeah. Well, I like digging into things like this because there is such a bubble that we live in of positivity and the highlight reel and especially the people that you see as the top of their career in health and fitness. They look amazing. It looks like they're making money. They're crushing life. They're you know, fit and they've got it all figured out. And I think that um, there's also this narrative of resilience where it's sort of the easy go-to is like, oh, well, like, you know, 
if you're used to doing hard things in the gym, you can do hard things in life. And not to say that that isn't true to some degree, but I think that the reality is people resonated with what you posted and people resonate with this topic because people go through hard things that are just plain messy and don't have a clear solution and they're looking for support and they're faced with a choice like that and they're afraid to make choices like that. And so I think that digging into what creates resiliency to go through hard things really, like not just the narrative of it, but, you know, the people in your life and the mechanisms that you know you can rely on because this is a topic that you I know that you coach your own personal clients in as well and that our staff of coaches coach their clients in and that everybody's going to face in their life at one time or another and so I'd just like to hear your thoughts on on what is really the equation for resiliency in in that context Hmm. yeah it's It's so, uh, I don't know how, what you said that got me thinking about this, or if this is just saying something you said a little differently. Um, because there is like, I get that question a lot. Like, why did you make that choice? Like, what was it about? Why did you choose to leave medical school? Mm-hmm. And sometimes I give people like the short, an- like the simple short answer, which is like, well, medicine, the, the medical the medical system was focused on sick care and I wanted to be focused on health promotion. And so it just didn't align with my, my, my vision of my, how I was going to be in this industry or something like, I just knew it wasn't for me. So I went this other route. Um, but I think the reality is that like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know many people that are just looking at this as a choice um, that they're going to like think through logically. They might think about that before they get in, you know, but like at this moment, it's like, should I stay in medical school? Or should I leave? Like, mm-hmm. I don't think that question is just popping up out of, out of nowhere. You know, it's getting the questions coming up because there's some, there's something happening inside that's throwing off your, your balance that throwing off like your, sense of you know levelness in life it could be like you have a massive amount of stress it's like it's hard it's like the medical school is hard like it's hard to succeed you're like getting bad marks like you can't keep up with the studying like oh my gosh this is not for me or you know it could be a variety of different things and feelings and emotions that are coming up Um, but there's something that's like eating away inside of you to the point where you're like huh like is this even right like this is so hard and so tough and so challenging in some way that I have to ask the question, is it even worth doing it? Because I think everybody understands that like things in life that are really rewarding, like take some effort. So, and I knew that about medical school, like medical school is hard. I went in like, this is going to be hard, but damn, is this supposed to be this hard? Oh man, this is really hard. This is hard physically, emotionally, mentally, yeah, it's supposed to be hard. I'll keep going. I'll keep going. I'll keep going. And, and, you know, as it got harder and harder and deeper and deeper into like levels and layers of who I am, that's where like, I really started to question, like, I think that there's, I think there's something wrong here. And the resilience part of this to even consider an alternative, uh, or the ability to consider an alternative, that's like step one. It's like, how do you even, what, what gets you to a point where, where you even like, there's another way. Cause there's a lot of people that are just living hard lives and they have no other way right? or they never will entertain another way. Yep. It's not part of their values or belief system to think that there's another way out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, or they might be in a physically in a place in life or, held at a certain place in life by, you know, socioeconomic status or political issues or religion or 
government, uh, who knows, like they can't, they can't make a change in their life. And for those of us who are fortunate and lucky to have options, what, what puts you in the camp of, I see that there are alternative options or I see that there are no options. Yep. I think I have to acknowledge that like, I am, ex- that this shows my privilege as a, a white male who is in medical school to be like, I could drop out and go do something else. And I, th- I mean, I didn't, it wasn't, I didn't think it this way. It wasn't so fleeting at the time, but like, if I do this, like I'm scared of not knowing what's going to come next, but I, I could, I'll probably be okay. Like I, I might, you know, like the thought is I'll be okay eventually. It didn't really feel that way at the time, but like it's possible and I've, people have done it. Whereas maybe somebody else who's in a, a different position is like, I cannot leave this. If I leave, like I am, I have no future. I, there's nothing else for me. This is the pinnacle of what I could accomplish as a human being in with my ethnicity, my, you know, gender, my whatever. And if I choose something different then I am, I'm, I'm out mm-hmm. and they don't get to, to, to make that choice. It, it, even if they might be as miserable as I was in the, those moments of my life. So, you know, there's some things that might be in and out of your control. And I know we're not here to talk about the things that are out of our control. So I'll talk about what's in our control, but I want to acknowledge that I had things that might be out of other people's control that I had opportunity to choose. And and that came from just who I, I, you know, who I was, what family I was born into a bit, um, also came down to the, the people that support me, you know, my parents, my brothers, um, my, my close family who believed that I could be a, a great, I could make a great contribution to the world and be a good person, even if I wasn't a doctor. And I know plenty of people that they were there because their parents were like, you're going to be a doctor. Right. And if you don't like one of my, one of my closest study academic friends in college was in that camp. He spent five years trying to get into medical school because it was like, you're going to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And then it was like when that actually didn't work for him because he couldn't get in, it was like, now you're going to be a lawyer because that's the only thing you can do. It's like, he just bounced through professional schools for years and he was not happy at any of them, but he had no choice because mm-hmm. that was his family's expectation. Um, the other thing that, so now the thing that I could control was I was able to very fortunately establish a m- many, many experiences uh, and, and, and like a keen awareness of who I who I was at my best, like in the, I had created months, years of recent memories and experiences that were like, whoa, you're, you're vibrant. You feel alive. You feel physically well, you're inspired, you're creative, you're liked as a, as a, as a being, not just for your status. Um, like I, I went out and collected a bunch of experiences in life and had re uh, reinforcement that like, Hey, you are great just the way you are. Like without the title of doctor, without any of that other stuff, like you're this, look at you, like you're, you're doing great. I did all that. I took this time off between college and medical school. It was like a two year period where I went out and I just like, I was like, I'm going out to like collect these like experiences that show that, that I can be, look at me like without all these labels and without being, you know, who I've been in the past. Like, am I even somebody? That was the question. Am I even worth anything without being the high performing athlete and academic and with the, with the great, you know, uh, accolades from school and getting into the good medic, like with all that, like, am I anybody? Let me go someplace where nobody knows who the fuck I am. Do people like me? <laughs> you know, can I like, I mean, can I feel confident in these places? My first go at it was kind of a mixed bag. I was like 
dude, I am terrified here. This is scary. Like nobody knows me. I don't know how to interact with people. Like nobody's high fiving me because I'm like on the soccer team. Like they don't care, you know. And when I end up meeting people and I say things like that, they're like, "Oh, cool. Well, what did you do this week? What like what are you doing today?" I'm like, "Didn't you hear? Like I." did all these things they're like, they're like don't care they're like what are we doing today who are you what's going on now you know I'm like oh my god i gotta like figure out who i am a little bit or before uh but like because that's that's all that's, people seem to care about who don't know who i am and aren't like caught up in the status thing like okay let's figure that out you know what what, what else can i do like let me go try something different, like a new job, or let me get around a new group of people, or let me try a whole new way of doing fitness that is nothing like what I did before. And let me just try all these new things and, and connect with these different communities and, you know, spend time at the ashram, you know, travel to Southeast Asia, uh, you know, go and volunteer and coach the high school team in this thing and coach the JV team. Don't be the varsity coach. That's like, you know, Oh, it's the varsity. It's like, no, I'm just running after a bunch of freshmen. Like I, we're not, we're not good. Like I didn't coach them to any wins. Like, but did they learn something from me? Did I impact their life? Did they want to talk to me two years from then? Like, did I have a positive experience and did they like right back and forth, you know, uh, teach, I taught a bunch. I taught kids who, didn't want to be listening to me. Like I put myself in a position to tutor students in SAT prep there. And these were the non-motivated, like they didn't care about what I was talking to them about. I'm like, okay, how do I, how can I show up and be a, an impact on people? Like I just did a lot of things and I accumulated a lot of experiences to sort of help redefine for myself. Like what does it look like to just be, um, be a human in this world. And, and I checked a bunch of boxes like, wow, I, I feel confident in myself. I, you know, I overcame something physically. Like I went from knee surgery right after college, putting on a massive amount of weight to getting back into shape, to feeling good and confident about myself, to new lifting PRs, to like learning, you know, getting my first introduction to CrossFit and like being interested in that. Like I, I made physical wins happen. I made, you know, challenging, uh, vocational things or work things happen. Like I put myself in challenging situations there. I, I went and tried to do something that, you know, was very uncomfortable, uncomfortable for me socially, like get into new social groups and put myself in new places where people didn't know me. And I had to like connect with humans. Um, I, I did a lot of like challenging things when I had the opportunity and started tallying up wins and wins and wins or, you know, and they, they didn't all, they weren't always successful. It's like I stumble, 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 stumble. Oh my gosh. Like I met two friends in Vietnam who were of different, but way different backgrounds. We had fun. They wanted to hang out with me for two weeks. They were like, let's stay another night together. Like, let's go this place together. I was like, oh my God. These people don't know anything about me and they wanted to hang out with me for two weeks and they had fun and I got photos to prove it before there were like iPhones. Like this is a win. Like I can find people that I can be friends with and, and like me for who I am anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so this is why I became such a, a fan of seeking out hard things in the years that followed was because those hard things and those uncomfortable situations that I worked through and found a way to, to turn into wins when I was at my lowest, lowest point and like, what in the hell am I going to do? I was like, well, I can always do this. I can always do that. I can always, cause I'd done it before. I've had, I've had, I put forth effort and, and got some success. And so now I'm at this, this next point where I'm like, I don't know what, what life could look like without this. Like now I'm going to strip this new, this whole identity away from myself. What could I be? Oh, I could be somebody. I could be mm -hmm. something on the other end of it. And so my resilience was really just a, this big mass of experiences that I had, I sought out. Like I didn't just like let life come to me. I was like, I'm going to go do these things. And, and, and learn how to be successful or have turned them into positive and grow from them and, you know, redefine who I am or what, what I can be as a person. And, um, I think when I went to medical school, 
on the heels of that time, I was like actually terrified. I was like, oh my God, I kind of just discovered that I'm this like really, I can be this really great person. I can love who I am and other people can like me too. And I can have these, I can do all these things. Oh, is this, this medical school thing is going to suck that away from me. It's going to strip all that confidence away from me. I was, I was scared it might. And, uh, and, and in, in a way it did, you know, and, and I lost touch a bit with who that, that, that person was, but they were strong enough experiences that were cemented inside of who I am that when I was at my lowest, I was like, I can, I can make, I can make something of myself even if I turn down and I say no to following this very, very prestigious sought after path that other people want to be on. And, but I, it's not, it's not right for me. The, the emotional core of who I am is telling me it's not right. It's scary as hell, but okay, I'm going to, I can make a decision like that. Mm -hmm. I'm very fascinated by your story because I also dropped out of college and I also was in the same place of terror and crying on my floor and having my mom rescue me. And I had such a different outcome from you in the way that I built my own resilience. And this is not to say that this could work for very many people um, because it's uncomfortable as hell, but um, just to offer it up. I think that um, when I left college, I was terrified because I had gone to college at age 16. And so I was two years ahead of schedule. I dropped out of high school to go to college and that dropping out of high school to go to college was a very positive, like I'm leaving this place I have no connection to for a future that I feel like is much more suited to my personality and something I'm really engaged in. I had a great first two years at my first school, but it was mostly a two-year school. It was a four-year school, but most people transferred out after two years because it was so small mm -hmm. that people left to go pursue more specialized degrees for the second half of their bachelor's degree. So I also transferred after two years, and the school that I chose was completely wrong for me. It was horrible. It was not friendly for transfers. I didn't fit in. I didn't make friends. No professors would support me, and the whole thing was like, that you had to get professors to kind of support your projects. Hmm. Didn't know anyone. They didn't care who I was. It was nightmare. And at the end of my first semester there, I was at the point where I had to choose whether to register for the second semester of the year. And I was basically at a dead end. I was like, I can't go on hmm. and do this. And, uh, and, but I came from a family where education was highly prioritized and, everyone went to University of Pennsylvania and I was out here at this liberal arts school doing a dance and creative writing degree. It was just like ridiculous. So I just felt like just the most deep utter failure. And it was really only my mom supporting me that kind of gave me the courage to just be like, look, this is not working clearly. Like whatever's happening here, this is not your future. And the next few years of my life after I dropped out were very dark and not a happy story and it took me probably four or five years to really find my footing and actually get going on a career or find a place and I was stable in that time I moved in with my brother who was supporting me and helping me out and he got me a job where he was working and I, I gradually sort of slowly made these like halting starts in life but I don't think that my own resilience at all came from I'm going to go out and try hard things and be engaged in the external world and use that to bolster my confidence because, hey, I can relate to these people and, hey, I can do this thing and, hey, I can try this new thing and succeed at it. I think that I just felt like a, a deep failure for a number of years and it was not a pretty story. But I think that the ultimate resilience that I found was really not through the external means, but really through the inner life and through really kind of sinking into what is meaning? Like is meaning being validated by other people or being, having my family be proud of me or me being proud of myself or me feeling like I'm making money or like what do these things actually mean? And I think that that was a time that I leaned very heavily on my spiritual path and, um, and on philosophy in general to just sink deeper and deeper into what 
really the the inner meanings of the world that I was experiencing at that time were. And that's why I say it's it's not a path that I recommend because I think that that also involves having some sort of support in terms of like someone who can guide you or talk you through that stage or have some resources to fall on because there are just some deep questions about the meaning of everything that come up that can lead down some scary places when you start to examine them um but i i just wanted to offer that up that perhaps there are multiple paths to finding resilience yeah i think both are very very valid in their own ways to look for external means and to engage in the world and and build yourself up that way and to look within and and to strip away and to be very uncomfortable with the reality that you're in Thank you for adding that and sharing that. I think both perspectives um, can also coexist too. And there's there's a little bit of work that happens on both both ends. I I continue to think that like <clears throat> one of the reminders you know, how do you stay so motivated? It's like well, it's not about motivation. It's about some discipline. You got to have discipline to just do things. But how do I like stay disciplined? Is a better question. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm, I, I'm doing this because I need to build. I know this is like my path to building resilience for when things do get really hard. Like I'm going to keep doing this thing because each time I check the box that I did it, yep. I'm like, I'm capable and I'm going to be capable and can continue to be capable of things. And it was, it was, it was something that unified a lot of people in fitness when CrossFit became popular. I uh, was like, if I can do that today, then I can do anything. Yes. Right. Yes. And you don't have to go and physically suffer to be able to, you know, take on the challenges of your job. Um, but physical effort is a, is a great lever to pull if you want to build resilience mm-hmm. and it's grounding and it's, yeah. So I, I'm not, a sh- I'm not afraid of it and I'm not shy of, I mean, I'm, I'm afraid of it sometimes, <laughs> yeah, <we are. laughs> but, but, um, but I, I, I don't, <clears throat> I know we preach like, a lot more, you know, methods of fitness that don't put you into that pain cave all the time, but the pain cave and, and the effort, you know, a physical work, high effort is, is, is a tool, valuable tool also. Yeah. 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 And I think one more thing I would add for the resilience toolkit is rhythm, like just daily rhythm, just focusing on what's in front of you, you know, at the times that I've been the most desolate in my life, like sobbing on the floor like how am I going to get through this day kind of situation it's like okay what do I need to do right now I need to go drink a glass of water I need to go do this I need to drive to this thing I need to breathe I need to eat something I need to get some sleep Mm -hmm. I need to move my body those just basic basic things yeah cool well thanks for hanging with us on this topic and this um story 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 time time. story time (laughs) um yeah, didn't anticipate getting uh getting so uh getting it getting so real today, <laughs> but uh, that happens sometimes. We went from, from OnlyFans with a duck to uh... <laughs> oh yeah, we started with was that this episode we started with OnlyFans? So, okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> Nate, Nate gave up on flashing the time. <laughs> yeah, his phone his phone <laughs> his phone died. died. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, thanks everybody and. Um, Yeah, go get yourself some FBB merch. Grab a new tea, grab a new (laughs) tank. (laughs) Only fans can. All right. Take care, everyone. All right, bye.